Geraldton Moor. Yeah. Oh, the car. Struck a jam. Five cars in one day. Wow. Okay, we're just going to get some water at this water point from Geraldton Moor. We just pulled up at Geraldton Moor and we're going to fill up our water containers. This is how you do it. Maybe I need to help. I might have to put the camera down. We'll see. Oh, someone's made it easier. Yeah, I did it. You did it? Yeah. Oh, that's a bit special. Here at um, Everett Junction. Everett Junction goes that way. Junction. Um, and that's Mount Everett. Just signing the visitor. side of the gun barrel and well because I'm out here all the time running tours backwards and forwards I put in stashes stashes of water fuel and food just in case something happens so I've got these stashes all the way across Australia so now that we've sold the business I've got to go and uh, collect them did you find it no it's um Remember the trees. I mean, there's billions of trees. Might just be another hundred yards up there, so we'll move on a little bit more. So I've got about what 50 yards down the road and I can see the tree. That was the tree I had to remember. The behind it should be the stage. found it. What? Yeah. Oh, they dug it up. Well, I've had a crack. Really? They can smell that? You can see all the poor, poor marks where they they've been trying to dig it, it up. They must have good noses. Well, there's food in there. Oh, yeah. yeah but, and they would have smelled humans. Yeah. So it's fuel as well or just food? Uh, fuel, food and water. Whew. 20 litres of fuel, four days supply of food and 10 litres of water. And a sign that says Magnus Desert Food Drops. So no one <laughs> takes it. But I suppose dogs can't read, can they? No. There we go. Oh, it's fuel. Is it leaks? No, it's just condensation. That'll keep a man alive for four days and enough fuel to get out of the truck for a moment. So, and a little bit of cardboard for the fire and matches everything you need.
So what is this? Well, this is someone's pride and joy, I'd say. Someone's built um, a trailer to carry all their fuel and bits and pieces while they're doing the gun barrel. And we first saw this, uh, how long ago were we here last when? Six weeks? Seven. Yeah, about six weeks ago. And um, it's still the same, still, uh, still with the same amount of gear. There's a few bits and pieces that have been pinched, but otherwise, it's still all here. There's lots of these trailers. Um, Pass about 13 on this section of um, trailers that just quite didn't make it, like this one. Um, this one has a broken axle. Quite elaborate, but I can see why it broke. It's carrying two 44s of fuel. There's 400 kilos, and um, with all the other bits and pieces, would be another couple of hundred, so 600 kilos on a little rickety unit like this over these sort of roads. Yeah. The wheels on a funny angle. We've tried oh, to fix yeah. the chain and things. It's got the tin of brake fluid. Containers of stuff. Oh well, the broken spring in there, so he's already broken a spring on it. What are you doing, babe? <laughs> um refuel time. Pulled up at the, at the service station here. Fill her up with diesel. Everything's so shiny and new. All our old jerry cans from the um, tour business were all well used. Pretty grungy. Everything here is shiny. truck because you just pour the cherry can straight in. But with this you gotta use a little nozzle. So you do it. down the gun barrel to find a um, an old camp spot that we camped at about a year ago and one of the guides left his phone on the ground when he put his shoes on so we're going to see if we can find it for him because it's got lots of photos on it and where are we when on the gun barrel in the middle, oh, in the middle of nowhere we just got here but um, I didn't have any waypoints but I did remember this group of trees. And so it's a pretty unique looking group of trees amongst no real trees. From memory, the fire, because he said he was next to the fire, put his boots on, he put it down. The fire was over there. If we find this phone, it'll be amazing. So I found the fire, I found the firewood, leftover firewood, because we always like to leave firewood for the next season. But he said it was near the fire. So it's a black Samsung from memory, but he was camped this way. What we need is a little, like a 
gold detector, which is a Samsung detector. Okay. I had high hopes that I'd find Scotty's phone, but we've walked around here now for an hour. Sun's about to set, so we better go and find a camp spot. But one of two things, either we just can't find it, or looking at the way the fire is now, I don't leave him like that. Um, so someone may have camped here just after us and found the phone. So we thought we'd give it an hour. We both walked around, heads down without any joy. So sorry, Scotty. The worst thing is not so much the phone, but a whole year's worth of tour video videos and photos uh, of his all gone. So we'll try again next year when we come through this spot. But um, for now, we're going to have to give up. Cheers. There's a weather balloon going up. It goes up twice a day. Oh, we were here in time. So that's to see what the winds are doing aloft. It's a bit shaky because I've got full magnification zoom thing. It's still going up and up and up. So what just happened? Balloon went up. And why did the balloon go up? Because um, they release, all over the world, they release um, a couple of balloons every day. And that, I think, don't know if it's all the time, at the same time all over the world, or it's definitely the same time all over Australia. And that gives them a snapshot at um, two particular times per day of what's happening with the air at all different levels, with the wind. Um, so that they can both measure and forecast what the wind's doing over a 12 hour period. Um, so the balloon just went up, we just got here in time to see it because we rushed this morning, got up early and we just got here in time. So there's no tours today, otherwise we would have given you a good demo of this place. I've been on quite a few tours here and it's so interesting, but we'll show you around. So where are we? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I suppose you could know where we are. Giles, I can't say this next word very well, meteorological station, um, which this site was picked by a fellow by the name of Len Bedell, who also was in charge of the construction and surveying of over 6,000 kilometres of roads throughout Western Australia, Northern Territory and South Australia. He put, he was in, he was commissioned to put these roads in by um, the Brits when they initially started their um, rocket testing here in Australia. They during the Cold War, um, after, just after the Second World War, um, there were rockets going from Russia to America all over the place, but the British had nothing. Um, and they couldn't do any rocket testing in England because it's too small. So they came here and started um, the Blue Streak rocket. I'll show you one in a minute. The Blue Streak rocket program. Um, and that was all done from a place in South Australia called Woomera. Um, interesting reason why they chose that name because a Woomera is, I'll show you one in a second is a wooden stick used to accelerate the speed of an Aboriginal spear. Um, it multiplies the, the speed, so they chose the name of the uh, launch site, uh, Woomera, be because it has something to do with speeds of things going through the air. Um, we're getting off target here. So this was this was site was picked by Len Bedell, who I'll show you the grader in a minute that actually cleared this site. Um, back in 58, um, there'll be the right date will be on the screen about there. Um, and so then it was put in and it's manned by about six or eight people. They're here for three or six months, I can't remember. It was years ago since I did the last tour here. Uh, and they take weather observations, um, all sorts of observations. I'll show you a really interesting um, instrument in a second. 
which if you were to if you were if someone was to say to you build me something that will measure the sun's intensity throughout the day and record it without any moving parts how would you do it i'll show you how it works um and then they measure um walk this way this enclosure here is called a stevenson screen right it all the instruments um, when they're measuring are all inside a Stevenson screen. That then um, it deflects any winds that are around, it puts it in shade, they're all the same and so therefore all the, inst all the measurements um, will be have the same um, same constant around them which is the Stevenson screen. In here you've got a dry bulb and a wet bulb thermometer um, dry bulb is just a normal thermometer and the wet bulb has this usually has water in it and that keeps the bulb wet and the difference in these two you can at 25 degrees you can calculate the relative humidity then you've got a maximum and minimum thermometer which um, move a little I think it's a bit of something down one end um, and it records a minimum maximum that's what's inside the Stevenson screen then over there you've got a whole heap of other instruments that we're not allowed to go there. They measure all sorts of stuff. But I'll show you inside. When I first came here in 83, um, this wasn't a dry community, a dry area. I mean, they had a, the coolest little bar. And from memory, it was in here. Um, someone who's been here uh, Previously in the 80s, can let me know if I was right, but I think it was in here and it was a tiny little bar. And I had a couple of beers, but now it's the information center. The so first thing you see as you walk in is, I'll just turn the lights on, does that work? Is a painting done by Len Bedell, he was a great artist. It was done back in 58. Um, so that tells me that the weather station was built before then. Um, he was an incredible artist. Um, some more of his work down here, up here, all over the place. And this is um, a bit of interesting stuff. Um, the weather balloon you saw go up in a second ago carries all this stuff down the bottom here, which has a radar reflector, the balloon, a GPS transmitter, sonde, a battery, and some other bits and pieces. Now that just goes up. And when the balloon bursts, it disappears. This is what I cut my teeth on. That is what I cut my teeth on when I first started as an apprentice. That's a Traeger HF radio. This is 6924 code made in Australia. It's a 7113 power supply and the switch unit. So I used to repair these when I was a young fella working in Northern Territory. Um, in the early days for all the calculations, they use slide rules, of course. Um, the paper recorder for, I think this is for temperature, I can't quite read. Uh, yeah, but the interesting thing I'll tell you about, if you were, to, if you were commissioned to invent um, this thing to measure the sun's intensity and record it, how clever is this little puppy? It's a sunshine recorder. So what you've got is a glass sphere, Behind it, you've got a, a holder, semicircular. In that holder goes a piece of paper, right? So as the sun shines through, it magnifies through the sphere and it burns the piece of paper. And depending on the size of the burn, it tells you the intensity of the sun at the time and it's in graduated throughout the day. So that is a sunshine recorder. It's so clever. is an interesting machine. It's a pluviograph. It, um, rain falls in through the funnel. It, um, it fills a small container, which is recorded, which is connected to an arm, which is connected to a pen, which is connected to a clockwork, um, clockwork charting now. And that measures in 0.2 millimeter um, graduates. And when it gets to five millimeters, it triggers another unit and the thing tips over, empties the water out, stands itself back up again, resets the arm and records again. 
So that's a pluviograph. Another interesting bit of weather recording stuff. Fascinating. It's been used for more well, centuries now. As you can see, the clock says one minute past nine. Does it? Yeah, one minute past nine. Um, a f couple of hundred meters ago, the time was half past seven. That's because, this is the interesting fact, the area here, I think it's about a couple of hectares, um, was, is gazetted, it's, we're in Western Australia, we're still in Western Australia for another hundred odd kilometers um, to get to the border of South Australia, of Northern Territory. Um, but we're actually in South Australia here. This area has been gazetted to South Australia. It's, it's within Western Australia. Um, but because the whole rocket program was uh, administered in South Australia by the South Australian government to keep everything uniform, time and, and, and paperwork and all that sort of stuff, they work in, as South Australia here in Western Australia. So that's why the time here is in Central Time which is South Australian time, and not in Western Australian time, which is where we are in Western Australia. A bit of interesting information. So a Woomera, I was gonna show you a Woomera, there's not a real Woomera here, but it's in, in the painting. Um, so this spear, as you can see here, um, or Kalata, which it was called in, in Aboriginal, it's made from the Tacoma bush, which is a real hard, good hardwood. It's reasonably straight, and to get it exactly straight, they would heat it over the fire, bend it over their knee um, until they got a really straight spear. And you can throw the spear whatever speed your arm moves, that's how fast the spear moves. But if you've got this little bit here, which has got a little hook on the end, which hooks into the end of the spear, then the spear lays in the, there and you're holding onto this end, which has got a lump of um, gum or something like that at the end to stop your hand slipping off. As you bring your hand up, it doubles the speed of the spear because you're you because of how it works. Uh, I could explain it all, but you'd all be really bored. So that doubles the speed of the spear, and um, you can throw faster. It also halves the accuracy. So for every plus is a minus. So until you get really proficient with it. Um, it's very hard to throw straight. And I just noticed another thing behind Wendy here. This little item. Oh. This is a waddy. Right? Um, used uh, for two reasons. It, it's heavy, it weighs a ton, right? And it's hardwood. And it's used for killing, uh, killing things. Not people, but animals. Um, they also used to bang them together. I had another one here. Um, I won't use metal on it. Um, because of the, the hardness of this, it has a really nice resonant frequency and it makes a great sound while the music's going and during the corroboree. But that's a waddy. You can see here all the, the oil of people's hands over the years. Um, and here, so that's where it's used for bashing bung arrows and things like that. So there's a bit of, just notice, I've never seen it before. It's all sorts of stuff, it's so interesting. This is the rocket you pointed to when you were at the doorway. So yeah, this is the um, nose section of Blue Streak rocket. Um, and it was launched in 64, um, but it wasn't found again till, the, till about 1980 um, when someone found it out in the bush. So yeah, this is what they, that's what it was all about, sending these up. Um, they didn't have nuclear warheads on them here, but um, they wanted to be able to perfect the launch and, um, and trajectory of the rockets. So that's what the whole thing was about. All the roads we've been on for the last few days were all built for that. This is called the cat cage. It um, protects the grader that built 6,000 kilometers of roads we've just been on. Um, this grader used to be over there in a shed years ago and you could sit on it and have your photo and things like that, but to protect it now, it's been put in the cat cage. Um, it's a caterpillar grader. 
it's a model 10 something 1004M I think um, it's all manual there's no hydraulics it's all dog clutches um, really hard to drive these things but um, the fellow who drove it Scotty Board he drove it seven years with Len uh, to build the roads and um, and it's preserved here beautifully and it's responsible for all the corrugations <laughs> well not the corrugations but the road so yeah that's a bit of history sitting here we're just driving into a place called Lassiter's Cave action here we, here we are this is my turn to be the tour guide at Lassiter's Cave tiny little cave bloke called Harry, I think. Harold Bell Lassiter. Harold Bell Lassiter turned up here looking for gold, got caught out. Aboriginals helped him, looked after him. He left here and about 50 days later, unfortunately, he perished in the desert. Now, maybe I'll tell you the real story because that was mostly a load of rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't a load of rubbish, but um, yeah, Harold Lassiter was a. Uh, it was a bit of a con man, really. He managed to dupe the um, Victorian government into believing that there he had discovered a seam of gold called Lassiter's Reef in Western Australia, just east of Kalgoorlie. Um, so after he duped the, uh, um, I'll do the short story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's, he started off being a con man up in places called Ruby Vale and Emerald and Sapphire and places like that. Anyway, he he's only a young guy. Where was he from? I can't remember. Anyway, he um, he duped the Victorian government into giving him a lot of money because it was in the 30s, depression was on, the Victorian people needed something to believe in, so they spun this big, he spun this big yarn, they gave him money, he took a team of people out to find the reef. After searching and searching and searching, they couldn't, he couldn't locate it, so they left him. Um, then he walked back here with his camels and his camels bolted down the road. He managed to make it to this cave and where uh, he was found by Aboriginal women who brought him back from the brink of death. He okay. gave him a few litres of water. He stayed a few days. And then on the 24th of January, 18 something, I'll tell you the, the real date will be there somewhere. Um, and uh, he left and he perished about 20 kilometers down the road. He was making his way back to Mount Olga, which is a good one week walk. Yeah. And you don't do that in the middle of January with two liters of water. So that's his story. But Wendy's story is pretty good. Yeah, mine was better. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's yeah, where we are this now. Is it. Yeah. Little cave. Here's the real truth. But my story sounded reasonably convincing. <laughs>